Hello, this is lecture 21 in social neuroscience. In this lecture and the next lecture, we'll be covering morality. A lot of this overlaps with material in chapter 13 of Sapolsky's book. You're also going to find that this lecture covers several levels of analysis, including brain activity, looking at fMRI and EEG activity. We'll look at hormones a little bit, evolution's discussed. We even cover development. So this is one of those topics that really uh, does involve many levels of analysis. So in this lecture, I'm going to focus more about cooperation, fairness, and honesty. The next one will be, the next lecture will be more about moral decision making. So today I'll be talking about the evolution of cooperation, the development of cooperation, norms of cooperation and fairness, trust and cooperation, and honesty. All right, so we'll start with the evolution of cooperation. And the topic of this evolution of cooperation is something that's of interest to many uh, researchers across different disciplines in anthropology, primatology, psychology. Uh, one person that you can look to to get some understanding about this is uh, Joan Silk, uh, pictured here, and then she had this paper that was published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 2016 with um, House. In this paper, she talks about, compared to humans, the other primates cooperate very little. So you might be surprised by that. You might think that primates are just generally cooperative, just like humans are, but that's not really the case. And so the question is why? Why are humans different that way? And she entertains three different hypotheses in this paper. One is that human cooperation is just based on the same fundamental elements that are evolved in other, that evolved in other cooperative animal societies. It's just that we kind of do it more so. Like we have the same exact elements that everybody else has, the other species, but we just do a little bit more of it, all right? The second uh, sort of hypothesis on this is cooperative breeding is the basis of cooperation in some primates and in humans. And third is that humans have capacities for collaboration, group level cooperation, and altruistic social preferences that are linked to our capacity for culture. So I'm gonna go ahead and take each of these hypotheses and look at them in a little bit more detail. So let's take the first one about hypothesis one, that we have the same evolutionary foundations like kin selection, contingent reciprocity and mutualism. Surely these are found in humans and they're found in other primates, but does that really do enough of a job to explain why humans are especially cooperative? Now, what you can see here is a, um, figure that comes out of this study, this paper by Burkhardt et al. in 2009, in which they compare the pro-sociality, how much you know, a particular species is willing to work and take care of another member of their species. And they have broken it down to chimpanzees and bonobos are at the bottom. So you can see that chimpanzees and bonobos are not particularly pro-social. They're a little bit more pro-social for a closely bonded kin and closely bonded non-kin. So people who are, you know, people, I should say, chimps or bonobos who are in their, um, their most closest group, who they may be related to, might be their daughter or their sister, um, or it could be that they just live together in the same um, uh, troop all the time. They do show them a little bit more pro-sociality, pro -sociality, but for fellow group members, for other chimps and bonobos, they don't really show much of pro-sociality to them. They're certainly not going to do this for group members who come, who are just like them, other chimps or true strangers. Um, so that's chimps and bonobos, not particularly uh, pro-social. Capuchins are monkeys that do show more of this processality to their closely bonded kin and their closely bonded non-kin. But again, when you look at fellow group members, other capuchins that might be part of their larger grouping, they're not particularly pro-social to them. They're certainly not going to be pro-social towards anonymous group members who they don't even know. And they're not gonna be, um, like I said, <laughs> pro-social to st complete strangers. And then we get to marmosets and tamarins. They are more like humans in terms of their prosociality. They're very cooperative. They're uh, prosocial towards closely bonded kin, closely bonded non-kin, and fellow group members. But when it comes to anybody who's outside that group, nope, there's no any kind of collaboration that's going to go on, any cooperation. And then finally, we get to humans. And you can see humans are um, fairly high in prosociality up there with the marmosets and tamarins in terms of closely bonded kin, closely bonded kin, closely bonded non-kin, fellow group members. And they'll even show some prosociality to people who are anonymous group members, that is, people who supposedly belong to their group, uh, maybe they've just been told that this is a person who 
is in their group. Um, they have wear the same color t-shirt, they have the same accent. And so they'll show pro-sociality to them even though they don't identify them knowing for sure that they're in their group. And then they don't show as much towards true strangers. So you can see that sort of drop off there is sort of common with the uh, marmosets and tamarins, except that we do extend as humans more pro-sociality to anonymous group members. And so that's kind of the key difference here. And so if it was all just about kin selection, contingent reciprocity, mutualism, you would expect that among the primates then we'd all be fairly the same, all four uh, groups here, but we're not. And so there seems to be something more than just these basic evolutionary foundations that differentiate us in terms of how um, cooperative we are. So the second hypothesis that Silk entertains is a, um, a hypothesis that has to do with cooperative breeding. And the idea here behind cooperative breeding is that humans and some other primates are cooperative breeders. That is, they have allo maternal care. The care, the care that they provide for their infants and their children um, can occur by others in, in, besides the mother. All right. This can include the father, it can include other relatives, members of the troop or the rest of the group. So humans and some other primates are these kind of cooperative breeders. And you can see in this drawing here that we have a family, a group of cooperatively breeding golden lion tamarins. And the females can give birth to twins twice a year without experiencing any lactational amenorrhea. Amenorrhea. The mother can afford this high energetic investment because the infants are carried and after weaning provisioned by all the group members, mostly fathers and older siblings, but also non-relatives. So this means that they share um, um, in the offspring um, caring that uh, gets shared across the group and humans do this as well as um, these other primates. And so the, uh, the idea is that perhaps the reason why we are particularly cooperative as humans is because of this feature that we share with, for instance, tamarins, that we don't require just the mother to take care of the child. We can do it as a village or as a group, we can all care for it. And so that leads us to having more cooperative breeding, I'm sorry, more cooperation. However, as Silk points out, humans are more likely to share their care with non-genetic relatives compared to like tamarins. That is, we do actually pass off that allo maternal care to lots of other people who maybe are part of our group, but they're not our genetic relatives. We can have daycare people take care of it. We can have friends watching over our children. Um, there are also multiple breeding pairs in the group. So in, in among a group of humans living together, multiple pairs are probably having offspring at any given time. Whereas the other primates that do cooperative breeding tend to have just one or two pairs that do all of the uh, offspring. And so the rest of the animals are taking care of the offspring of those um, few pairs that are actually having offspring. And our human group size is much bigger than um, the other cooperative breeders. So cooperative breeding probably isn't the only real explanation then about why humans are particularly cooperative. So that leads us to hypothesis three by Silk, and that's collaboration and culture. Humans rely a lot on culturally transmitted information, much more so than animals do. Sure, some other animals may have some culture, but we do a lot to pass it down. We have a lot of learning that goes on and modeling and telling you know, the next generation about how to do things. Um, early humans, for instance, had a much wider range of habits than any habitats than any of the other great apes, and they relied on diverse resources and animal prey, which then led to greater interdependence with the group and more culturally transmitted information. So this wide range of habitats, not habits, this wide range of habitats meant that we could, because we were cooperating, we could go ahead and work in lots of different um, uh, varied locations, habitats, and you know, basically exploit the resources, get the food, hunt for different kinds of animals because of our interdependence within our group. And also the fact that we could pass on the information through culture. We could tell the next generation about how to hunt for this tiger or to collect berries or whatever it happened to be. Another kind of important point about all this is in terms of our uh, early human ancestors is that all that those hunter gatherers would have done a lot of food sharing because not everybody in the group would have been able to catch the food or gather the food. Um, and so food sharing among hunters and gatherers is really a, a form of risk pooling. That is, you have to rely on the fact that maybe this time the person doesn't bring us any food, but maybe sometime in the future they will. So we're going to go ahead and share with them, give them some food now under the hopes, you know, the hopes that we have a collaboration here. They're going to bring some food at another time when they're luckier about catching food. 
Um, and so this would favor the evolution of cognitive skills, for instance, um, you know, having perspective taking to understand like why the other uh, member of this group couldn't uh, hunt today, and also gives us mutualistic collaboration. So this is trying to say that it's this kind of combination of culture and the fact that we were able to spread across a wide range of habitats and and um, also because we were sharing our food in this very organized way of um, that we were able to develop uh, cooperation and make it make our species particularly um, highly cooperative. Now all of this is not to say that other primates don't cooperate. In fact other primates do cooperate to different extents from humans. It's just that we humans are very very cooperative compared to the other primates. So especially this is so among our non-relatives that we cooperate. And some of the ways that we cooperate include things like direct reciprocity, where individuals dispense favors and the favors that are then returned by the recipient in times of future need. Or indirect reciprocity, where a person dispenses the favors, but the favors are then returned via a third party. So I do a favor for you, and then I get it back because you're going to have like your sister or your mother help me out on some future thing. So there are different ways that we do cooperate, and it's something that we have highly established amongst ourselves. But for reciprocity to work, that must mean then that individuals have to interact with their partners repeatedly over a long period of time. You do find cooperation working better among people who are not strangers, right? So if we can cooperate together, even if we originally were strangers, by cooperating repeatedly over a longer period of time, I get to know your history. I get to know whether or not you're going to cheat me or not reciprocate. You must also be able to recognize your conspecifics, you know, the other members of your group, the members of your species, to keep track of them, and also discriminate against anybody who doesn't reciprocate. And you also must inhibit the temptation to accept but not reciprocate, because this will be harmful in the long run. So these are all things that we have um, taken into our human cooperative framework. And so the next question I want to look at is, then how do we develop this? How do we come about having these sorts of norms, these sorts of uh, behaviors that are associated with cooperation? So that leads us to development and looking at it in terms of children um, specifically. Now, you'll remember that back in chapter seven in Sapolsky, he talked about Kohlberg's stages of moral development and some of the, he laid it out, talked about what it was. You might remember that there are these three levels of moral development, and then there's two levels for each of the stages, as you can see in this drawing here. And all of these levels uh, depend on reasoning skills. So you can see that it even says the word reasoning here for each of the levels. Level one is pre-conventional reasoning. Level two is conventional reasoning. Level three is post-conventional reasoning. Um, and so the idea behind the Kohlbergian school of thought here is that as the child's uh, reasoning abilities improve, then you're going to get higher and higher stages of morality. Um, and so it's really basic there until you get to about adolescence, where there's enough uh, cognitive resources being uh, turned on that you can have this more elaborated, like conventional or post-conventional morality. Now, one of the main criticisms of the Kohlberg stages of moral development is this emphasis on reasoning ability. It makes it sound like it's very cognitive and it depends on the, the person's individual cognitive abilities. Um, people like Jonathan Haidt, though, you might remember when he talked about moral foundations theory, argued that that didn't make sense to him, that perhaps there's too much emphasis being put on Kohlberg, for example, on reasoning. Because plenty of young children and a lot of non-human primates do show some of these moral foundations. They display rudimentary senses of fairness and justice, suggesting that perhaps in addition to all that cognitive reasoning, um, developing intuitions and emotion are going to be important as well. And so it's not going to be just about your cognitive reasoning that will uh, determine whether or not a, a child is showing moral behavior. Now, as an example of this, we can look at some work that comes out of Jean Dessetti's lab at the University of Chicago in the United States, um, and this is where they looked at young children and generosity. They hypothesized that both automatic and controlled processes play a role in moral judgment and behavior. Okay, So they think that perhaps some of this stuff is like t intuition or emotion. That would be more automatic and controlled. It might be more about a reasoning sort of process. But these things um, could happen fairly early. 
uh, much earlier than you would expect in Kohlberg's stages, all right? So what they did is they used EEG, eye tracking, and behavior with 57 children between the ages of three to five years old. The EEG collected occurred during the time that they completed the moral sensitivity task, this Chicago moral sensitivity task, I should say, the CMST. What the short Chicago moral sensitivity task is, it's a series of short scenarios, these three panel cartoons like you see here at the top or at the bottom of this picture, in which you see two cartoon characters engaging, engaging in either intentional harm, which is like you see up at the top row, or intentional help, like as you see here at the bottom row. And then where the red arrow are is where those red arrows are in the picture, that would depict where they go ahead and start the EEG recording for an ERP, for event-related potential. Like I said, there are three pictures presented one at a time in the sequence, and then there are 140 trials of this in the actual study. So what did they actually find? Well, these ERP waveforms that they did over all these trials were then averaged into ERP waveforms, right? So they're gonna take the EEG trials, average across them to get event-related potential waveforms. And there were three that they looked at in particular. The first one was is called the early posterior negativity waveform. And you can see what they're trying to show you here is that it occurs between 100 and 175 milliseconds. So right around the time of that second picture in which the, um, the cartoon character is either helping or harming the other one. And you can see that within those 100 to 175 milliseconds, there's a difference there between um, scenarios that show harming versus helping. All right, so that is that the waveform was greater for helping than it was for harm. So already they seem to be having an emotional reaction, noticing helping behavior as opposed to harming behavior. Then there's another component here called the N2. This happens between 290 and 375 milliseconds. This was also greater for harm than it was for helping. Right, so there's some sort of uh, difference here and that N2 has been um, hypothesized to reflect times when you have cognitive conflict, when you're dealing with something maybe that was not expected. And then finally, the LPP, the late positive potential, that's occurring between 380 and 600 milliseconds. So this is clearly like almost a half a second after the image has been presented. And this was greater for helping than it was for harm scenarios. All right, so fine. What we've shown then is some early, middle, and late ERP components that are sensitive to whether or not they're watching a harming or a helping uh, scenario. The issue here is how does this relate then to the um, child's morality, it, the child's generosity? So what they did is the study also included a chance for the participants to be generous. So after they had watched all of those um, scenarios from the CMST, then what they did is they had them play what's called the dictator game. The participant, the, the kid, was given 10 stickers as a reward for participating going through the CMST. And they, told, they were told that these are your 10 stickers, you get to keep them. However, this is all I have now, and so that would mean that the kid who comes after you isn't going to be able to get any stickers themselves. right? So they're being told, these are 10 stickers, they're your 10 stickers to keep but I have run out of stickers now and I won't be able to give any more to the next child that comes along. So then they say, would you like to give any of your stickers to the next child? All right, so kind of pose them a moral question here, a chance where they could be generous. You know, Do you wanna share your stickers with the next child? And then the experimenter would turn his back to the child and the child could then place the stickers in a box. They had two boxes there in front of them. One box was for themselves. So if they put a sticker there, they would be able to keep the sticker. If they put the sticker in the other box, that would mean that the other child would get the um, sticker. So this is a way then they could measure generosity by seeing how many stickers they would actually give to the other child while the experimenter's back was turned. Of course, the reason why the experimenter has their back turned is so that um, the kid won't feel like there's some sort of social demands on them to um, behave in a generous way. So the number of stickers given to the other child was that measure of generosity. Now think back to the ERP components that happened during the CMST. Which of those ERP components from watching the CMST should predict generosity? Well, what Dissetti and Cowell reasoned was that if these moral evaluations are primarily automatic, that is, a young child like this just automatically knows what's right and wrong, 
behavior then should be limited, or sorry, linked more to the EPN waveform responses. So they thought generosity would be best predicted by the EPN difference between harmful and um, helping. And so that would tell us that it was, if it was primarily an automatic sort of response. If, however, these moral evaluations are primarily controlled responses, that is, require some reasoning, some you know, further elaboration here, then any generous behavior should be linked more to the LPP waveform response that occurs like at you know, 500 to 600 milliseconds. So that's a slower response, and it would be a place where you know, you'd have more cognitive control over your response when you're watching the CMST. And perhaps then that if, if our, again, our generous behavior is primarily something we control rather than it's something that's automatic, we should see the generous behavior linked more to those LPP waveform responses. Well, what did they find? They did actually find that the EPN and the N2 were not related to generosity. So they didn't get anything for that early component of the EPN. It wasn't related to generosity. What you see here in this figure is an emphasis on the LPP because the LPP did predict generosity. So you can see that green line going through the middle there. That green line is the difference between what their average response was to a harm video versus a helping video or helping scenario. And so that green line then becomes the measure that they can look at in terms of how big of a response do they get on that and does that predict um, the generous behavior. So in the graph up above, you can see this is when they had the full sample of participants in the study. And basically what we see is a correlation of 0.33 that the bigger that difference between helping and harming um, in the LPP, the more the child was willing to share their stickers. Now at the bottom, what they did was they went ahead and just picked the kids who shared at least one sticker because there were plenty of children who didn't actually share any stickers whatsoever. And so they're included up at the top graph. But what about the ones who um, shared at least one sticker? And you can see there down at the bottom, there's only 20 of those children who shared at least one sticker. So this isn't something that's universal across these kids. But among the kids who shared more than one sticker, you can see that there is even a stronger relationship between the LPP difference between helping and harming and how many stickers they are willing to share. There's a correlation there, a 0.488. So here you have children between three and five who seem to be doing something generous. They seem to have some moral behaviors here that are occurring, like I said, earlier than what you might expect from Kohlberg stages of moral development. And so this suggests that they already have a good sense of what sharing is and generosity and maybe some cooperation here. Now, even though, keep in mind here, they're not gonna get reciprocated cooperation, right? Cause you're gonna be giving your sticker to a box to a kid who's gonna get it at the next session that you're never gonna meet. But there's that implied thing of this anonymous group member that you're willing to share with that these young children already seem to understand. Now, this sort of fairness, this sense of fairness and generosity isn't limited just to young children. Um, that is, it's also found in non-human primates as well. Again, further suggesting that this isn't just about Kohlberg's stages of moral development. And so in order to talk about that, I'm going to go ahead and show you this brief video that comes from, um, from TED, in which you'll see Professor Sarah Brosnan, who's at Georgia State University, talking about some work that she did with Franz Duvall um, in, involving capuchin monkeys and, and their sharing and fairness. I'll point out, by the way, just as a little side note, that when I left Georgia State University back in 2007, uh, Professor Brosnan then took my office. And so it's fun to see in this video, she's actually in my old office there. Um, I recognize the furniture in the picture, but that's just a little side comment here. Here she is. My first year in graduate school studying cooperation in monkeys, I spent a lot of time outside just watching our groups of capuchin monkeys interact. One afternoon, I was out back feeding peanuts to one of our groups, which required distracting one of our males, Ozzy, enough so that the other monkeys could get some. Ozzy loved peanuts, and he always tried to do anything he could to grab some. On that day, however, he began trying to bring other things from his enclosure to me and trade them with me in order to get a peanut. Now, capuchins are smart, so this wasn't necessarily a surprise. But what was a surprise 
was that some of the things that he was bringing me, I was pretty sure he liked better than peanuts. First, he brought me a piece of monkey chow, which is like dried dog food. It was even made by Purina, and for a monkey, is about as worthless as it gets. Of course, I didn't give him a peanut for that. But he kept trying, and eventually he brought me a quarter of an orange and tried to trade it with me for a peanut. Now, oranges are a valuable monkey commodity, so this trade seemed, shall I say, a little bit nuts. Now you may be wondering how we know what monkeys prefer. Well, we ask them by giving them a choice between two foods and seeing which one they pick. Generally speaking, their preferences are a lot like ours. The sweeter it is, the more they like it. So, much like humans prefer cupcakes to kale, monkeys prefer fruits like oranges or grapes to vegetables like cucumbers, and all of this to monkey chow. And peanuts are not bad. However, they definitely don't prefer them to a chunk of orange. So when Ozzy tried to trade a quarter of an orange for a peanut, it was a surprise. And I began to wonder if he suddenly wanted that peanut because everybody else in his group was getting one. In case you're wondering, I did give Ozzy his peanut. But then I went straight to my graduate advisor, Franz DeWall, and we began to design a study to see how the monkeys would respond when somebody else in their group got a better reward than they did for doing the same work. It was a very simple study. We took two monkeys from the same group and had them sit side by side, and they would do a task, which was trading a token with me. And if they did so successfully, they got a reward. The catch was that one monkey always got a piece of cucumber, and the other monkey sometimes got a piece of cucumber, but sometimes got a grape. And if you'll recall, grapes are much preferred to cucumbers on the capuchin monkey hierarchy. These are two of my capuchin monkeys. Winter, on the right, is trading for a grape, and Lance, on the left, is trading for a cucumber. You can see that she, and yes, Lance is actually a female, is at first perfectly happy with her cucumber until she sees Winter trading for a grape. Suddenly, Lance is very enthusiastic about trading. She gets her cucumber, takes a bite, and then throws it right back out again. Meanwhile, Winter trades again and gets another grape and has Lance's undivided attention while she eats it. This time, Lance is not so enthusiastic about trading, but eventually she does so. But when she gets the cucumber this time around, she doesn't even take a bite before she throws it back out again. Apparently, Lance only wants a cucumber when she hasn't just watched Winter eat a grape. And Lance was not alone in this. All of my capuchins were perfectly happy with their cucumbers as long as the other monkeys were getting cucumbers too but they often weren't so happy with their cucumbers when other monkeys were getting a grape. The obvious question is why? If they liked those cucumbers before, what changed? Now, I'm a scientist, and scientists are famously shy about reading too much into our studies, especially when it comes to what other animals are thinking or feeling, because we can't ask them. But still, what I was seeing in my monkeys looked an awful lot like what we humans would call a sense of fairness. After all, the difference in that cucumber was that it came after Winter got a grape rather than before. We humans are obsessed with fairness. I have a younger sister, and when we were little, if my sister got a bigger piece of the pie than me, even by a crumb, I was furious. It wasn't fair. And the childhood me is not alone. We humans hate getting less than another so much that one study found that if humans were given a hypothetical choice between earning $50,000 a year while others earned $25,000, or earning $100,000 a year while others earned $250,000, nearly half the subjects preferred to earn $50,000 a year less money to avoid earning relatively less than someone else. That's a pretty big price to pay. All right, now that we see that this happens with young children, it happens with non-human primates, let's go ahead and talk more about these norms of cooperation and fairness by looking at it in adults and, and how some social neuroscientists have looked at it with adults. So we'll take, first of all, the prisoner's dilemma game, a way that a lot of um, 
uh, researchers over the last 20 to 30 years, particularly people interested in economics, um, have been studying this kind of uh, behavior. So here's Jim Rilling, who's a professor at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. And he published a paper in 2002, Neural Basis for Social Cooperation. So what they did was they used the prisoner's dilemma game. And you might remember what this is. It's like if you are player A, you get a choice on each trial whether or not you're going to cooperate or defect. And then player B gets a chance to cooperate or defect. If you both cooperate, you're both going to get $2. If you defect um, and the other player says cooperate, then player A is going to get $3. So if you can swindle your uh, partner there, if you're player A, by saying I defect, they go ahead and cooperate and then you'll get $3. If, however, you say cooperate and they say defect, they get the $3, you get nothing. If you both defect, you only both get a dollar, okay? So in sort of, and you can see that the ideal way then is just for you both to cooperate. You'll always get $2 each then, um, and it won't be unfair. All right, so what they did was they did this iterated variation of the prisoner's dilemma game to study reciprocity. So 36 women were in an fMRI scanner, and this involved at least 20 rounds with another woman um, in the scanner, I'm oh, sorry, who wasn't in the scanner, but supposedly playing the game with you, or a computer that was playing with you. So you were told that there was another woman who's doing this with you, and that other woman sometimes was uh, a woman that actually you had met and is just as naive about the whole process as the participant is. Sometimes they were told that this is a, a woman again like that, but this time the woman was actually a confederate of the experiment, and that particular partner was told to go ahead and act sort of obnoxiously during the whole thing. And then there was this third sort of condition that could happen where you were told that you were paired up with a computer that was going to make decisions about cooperating or defecting. Okay, so as you know from reading Sapolsky, there's a lot of discussion in Sapolsky about this particular um, method of prisoner's dilemma. And you can see here that just sort of the different patterns of behavior that you get. I just want you to focus on the top three for now. This is where we have an unconstrained human partner who isn't told anything in particular. And you can see how much of the time they both do cooperation. That's CC, or they both defect. That's down at the bottom. And you can see gradually over time, over the 20 trials, you get this pattern where there's a lot of um, double cooperation, CC, but that starts to drop. And near the end of the experiment, you're going to see that there's just about as much uh, double defecting as there is double cooperating. And partly this has to do with a sort of a tit for tat uh, phenomenon that happens in these sorts of experiments. But we'll see that this happens, like I said, in other kinds of studies as well. In the next one, you can see in the next panel over for B, you can see what happens when you have a confederate partner who's been instructed to um, not be very cooperative. And you can see that very quickly they go from being double cooperative to um, lots and lots of uh, double defections. And finally, with the computer partner, you can see that in the beginning, the um, real human actually tries to experiment a little bit here with cooperating and defecting, but eventually reaches a steady state here of cooperating with the computer where they both get uh, the $2. So what Rilling looked at here in this study was how do um, how does the brain process this whole these steps in the in the multiple rounds that they're playing of the prisoner's dilemma, and so here's brain activity when the during that period when they're trying to decide when to cooperate. There were two areas in particular that became more active when they were deciding to cooperate. Um, so this is like during that period where they're just about to press the button to make a, make a cooperative decision when they have decided, because we know that they're going to end up deciding to press the button cooperate. So as they get ready to decide to cooperate, two areas that become active more than and, and other conditions would be the um, right ACC and you, oh, sorry, the rostral ACC. And then you can also see the striatum. Those two areas became more active. So the ventral striatum was associated with reward. And so the idea is that you're going to cooperate and you're probably anticipating that your partner is going to cooperate and we're going to end up with uh, you know, the money. And participants actually here did report that CC was the most satisfying outcome for them. They liked it when they both cooperated. Even if they did defect and the other partner um, cooperated and they ended up with $3, that wasn't as satisfying to them as when there's, there was a double cooperation. Now, why would there be some rostral ACC here? Perhaps it's processing emotional conflict. Uh, perhaps as you decide, you know there's a little bit of anticipation here because you don't know exactly whether or not your partner is going to cooperate with you, and that could be why there's some ACC activity going on. 
Now, what actually happens when you find out if you uh, your partner did cooperate with you, you get a double CC outcome. And so what they see here is that all three of these areas, the OFC, the striatum, and the paracentral lobule, all of these were more activated when um, they found out that they had just been uh, reciprocated with cooperation. So this kind of reciprocation, reciprocated cooperation where I cooperated, I and you cooperated, we didn't, uh, neither one of us defected. It's a very ideal situation. These are the areas that became more active when they had human partners. Only the OFC was activated when they were making, uh, when they found out that their computer had gone along with them and given uh, cooperated as well. So. What the uh, reeling et al. concluded at the end of this paper was that we have identified a pattern of neural activation that may be involved in sustaining cooperative social relationships, perhaps by labeling cooperative social interactions as rewarding and or by inhibiting the selfish impulse to accept but not reciprocate an act of altruism. So this is sort of a positive message. It's saying that the reason why we like to cooperate is because it's rewarding. We, like, we find it a positive thing when um, we cooperate and then, then the other individual cooperates back. All right, so that's one of these early, early studies. I mean, it's already 20 years ago now that Rilling et al. Um, collected these data and there's been many studies since. The other study that I wanted to tell you about at this point was one that we did cover in workshop three. You'll remember that we watched this Alan Alda video in which he was visiting Princeton University and he was put into a scanner. And that study that they were collecting data for during that video is the paper that you see here that was ultimately published in Science in 2003. Alan Sanfey, the guy who's in the foreground of that picture on the left, he was the one that was running the experiment. And Jim Rilling, who was the author, the lead author of that uh, previous study, was also in there with him. So Sanfi and Rilling were both, I believe, postdocs at the time in Cohen's lab. Jacob Cohen, the guy that's in, the, sorry, Jonathan Cohen that you see in the back of the picture. All right, so anyway, here's what actually happened in that study. So they had 19 participants in the overall paper that was published in Science. Remember, Science is a very, very prestigious paper, Science or Nature. And so to get into Science is really You've hit the big time. And keep in mind, back in 2003, you could do a study with just 19 participants and get into science. So there must have been something very clever about this particular study. It is actually the same study that you saw in the video. So if you remember how Alan Alda was treated, where he got introduced to the other 10 players and he also played with a, game, a computer. Well, the other person would um, offer to make a uh, offer to deal to you in the ultimate in game, saying, "Hey, uh, I've been given ten dollars, and I'm going to go ahead and keep some of it and give it to you, the other rest of it." And so, some of these offers were fair, like they might say, "I'm going to keep five, you get to have five. or some of them were really unfair, where I say, "I'm going to keep eight, and I'll give you two dollars." Okay. So those are the differences between fair and unfair offers. In the picture down at the bottom, you could see sort of what happens in the study. So you have this 12 seconds of a fixation point. Then you find out your partner. And you remember, this was exactly like what we saw in Eldon Alda's video. And then you find out what your partner is offered. It says here, Kelly gets $8, you get $2, all right? So you're given the offer. And then you have to decide whether you're going to accept or reject, right? So you could choose to accept or reject the offer, which meant if you rejected the offer that neither person got the money. So if you choose to accept the offer, she'll get $8, you get $2. If you reject the offer, that will mean that neither one of you gets the money on that trial. Okay, and you can see what happens in terms of accepting the offer or not. If it's on, and that's the graph that you see there in B. That if they're given a five-five split, you know, like a nice fair down the middle split there, um, they're likely to accept that at a very high rate, 100 percent of the time, whether it's a human or a computer. If it's a seven dollars versus three dollars split, so the Kelly keeps seven, she gives you three. You can see they're not as likely to accept that, but it's only just a little bit. Right, and it's no difference between a human and a computer. When we get to an eight dollar, two dollar split, that's when people start to view this as more unfair, and the acceptance rates now drops down to closer to fifty percent. It's a little bit higher for the computer, and then you can see finally when you get down to nine dollars versus one, a really unfair offer. That's when we get the lowest acceptance rates down to about forty, forty-five percent. Okay, so that's very much like I said what you saw in the video back in. Uh, week three's workshop. Now, what about what's going on in the scanner here? 
And what they found was that the main finding that they got number one here was the role of the insula. Okay, so the insula turned out to be quite involved in what was going on here. That is, responders rejected offers more because of that reciprocity, not because of the reciprocity of unkindness, but more because the inequality seemed to pain them. That is, you can see that there's actually more insula activity every time the other person gives an unfair offer. And so they interpreted that as saying that the insula is particularly sensitive to, um, you know, like disgust and other kinds of unsavory things. And so this idea that someone else is being unkind by not sharing their money with you is something that causes the insula to go up in more activity here. And so they argued that that was because it sort of pained to you. It pains you to um, have an unfair offer. Now, you could also interpret this in other ways because an insula, of course, is involved in lots of other aspects of social behavior, but at least back in 2003, they kind of interpreted it this way, that the insula was sort of sensitive to the pain of the unfairness of the offer. The other um, thing that they looked at in this study was who are those, what happens when people do accept unfair offers? So let's say there is an $8, $2, dollars $2 split and you accept it. You accept that unfair offer. What happens there? Well, you find that with the um, unfair offers, you get greater right DLPFC when they accept these offers. And this is greater than it is, the activity is greater there than it is in the insula. Um, and that the insula was greater than the DLPFC when they were rejecting the unfair offers. So you can see um, deciding to accept or to reject, if you accepted an unfair offer, that seemed to be the fact that you are, your DLPFC is basically telling you, hey, it's giving you some sort of motivation to go ahead and accept this unfair offer. But when people were in a trial where they felt that unfair offer, which is you know, too painful, the anterior insula is greater there. And so now they end up um, perhaps causing it um, to, to um, reject the offer, right? So the insula was greater there than the, um, when it happened. Um, perhaps they say there's this prepotent or immature kind of response to reject unfair offers, but that higher level cognition can override that impulse to accept such offers. So the anterior insula is sort of like this prepotent, immature response. Like every time there's an unfair thing, you have this revulsion, this, this rejection of something that's unfair, that pains me that you're unfair. But if you then take higher level cognition that maybe is reflected in the DLPFC, and it says to you, hey, if I accept it, at least I'll get some money. Right, so I'll end up with some money. It's better than getting no money here. And so you accept this offer, even though it is unfair. All right, so that is talking about some of these norms of fairness that we have. Let's move on now and talk about trust and cooperation. So what about trust? Well, many of our economic decisions, like when we're investing or buying a used car, et cetera, depend on our being able to trust other people. And we've talked about some of those first impressions of trust, you know, like you might look at somebody and decide whether or not um, they're a trustworthy person, but lots of trust also has to do with our history with people. As I said, as you keep interacting with them, you learn whether or not you can trust them. Now, another important uh, thing to consider here is the role of oxytocin. Oxytocin, we already know, plays an important role in the formation of relationships, but maybe it also plays a role in economic trust. And so Baumgartner et al. proposed that oxytocin reduces feelings of betrayal by modulating the subcortical circuits involved in fear, learning, and reward-related processing. So they thought that, for example, that if you do have some sort of feeling that someone screwed you over, they've done something untrustworthy to you, if you actually have increased oxytocin around that time, it's going to blunt that feeling that you get from your fear learning and reward related processing. And therefore, it's going to cause you to trust the person even though they've actually hurt you. And so this would have nothing to do with like risk aversion or anything like that. It has more to do with the fact that you dampen your feelings of betrayal when you have more oxytocin. So how do they look at this? Well, they use this common method, this paradigm that's used in this kind of research a lot called the trust game. So two players are given some money and player one is the investor, all right? And so player one must send some money to player two, the trustee, through the experimenter. Now it can be up to $12, for example, so they could decide whether or not they wanna give $2, $8, $12, 
they give it to the experimenter, and then the experimenter triples the amount of money, all right? So the experimenter is gonna take whatever that amount of money was, triple it, and give it to player two. Then player two, sort of like in the ultimatum game, gets to decide how to split the money. And so they can give a certain amount of the money back to player one. So player two is called the trustee, and this trustee then must send some amount of this tripled money back to player one, the original investor. Okay, so that would mean then that if everything worked right, let's say I go ahead and I gave $12 to the experimenter and then the experimenter triples it up to 36, player two could split it. So there's $18 for player two and $18 for the investor. So the investor would have made some money. But let's say the player two decides to pocket most of it. So it gets up to uh, $36, but then go ahead and keep 30 of it and give six of it back to player one, to the trustee. Then the trustee has lost money in the whole transaction and they've learned that they can't trust their trustee. Okay, so that's the basics of the trust game and it's used in lots of different uh, research like uh, in this, this, this area of looking at, for instance, neuroeconomics. So what did Baumgartner at all do? Well, they had 49 male students at universities in Zurich play either a trust game, like I just told you about, or for comparison, they also had them play a risk game in which there were like similar financial risks that were taken, but without a social partner. So you could put a certain amount of money in, possibly lose it, but there weren't any other people involved in it. It was just you and you betting uh, some money here. Now, half the participants were given oxytocin spray into their nose, and the other half were given a placebo spray before they played the game. They then played the game with their partner for six trials without any feedback. So they give their money um, to the experimenter, the experimenter then triples it, gives it to the partner, and then the partner supposedly gave you money back, but you don't find out for those first six trials about how it all has played out. Or if we're talking about the um, the financial risk game, you would have played that six times but not found out how much money you won or lost. But what happened was the experimenters actually gave false feedback. And so they did what they did is they went and manipulated it so that the participants were told that roughly 50% of their decisions resulted in poor investments. So that would mean that if they were playing the trust game that they had been betrayed a lot. About 50% of the time, the trustee had pocketed the money and not given it back or if they were gambling in that other risky game that they had lost their money 50% of the time. And then they were allowed to play this game again for six more trials. So they continued playing the game for another six trials to see how it affects their behavior that they've received that feedback, all right? So the idea here would be that if you had just been told in the trust game that 50% of the time, you know, three of those six trials, the trustee took more money than they gave to you then that would mean that you really shouldn't be trusting them, right? And so you might go ahead and, and give them less money now on the subsequent trials. Even though it gets tripled, you might say, I'm only gonna give them a dollar or two dollars or something like that uh, because you don't trust them. Or you could also say that if you're playing a, a risky kind of game where you can bet money, maybe you pull back on how much you risk, right? All right, now remember that half the participants have been given oxytocin, half of them have been given the placebo spray. How does this affect their behavior? Well, what we can see here is that behaviorally, participants in the placebo group decrease their investments in the trust game, whereas the oxytocin participants continue with the same level of trust. So over there on the right, look at the trust game. You can see that the participants who are in the placebo condition, um, when they get that feedback that they have been screwed like half the time, they very much give less money to the trustee. So they, as the investor, they give less, much less money for the next six trials. But look what happens for the oxytocin participants. They actually continue to increase the amount of money that they give to the other person. Now, I don't know if that was a significant increase, but they don't really decrease at all, right? So even though they've been given feedback that their partner is messing with them half the time, they're still going ahead and giving a lot of money. You'll notice that the oxytocin and the placebo don't have any effect in terms of how much risk people take. People, in fact, uh, did a little bit more risky behavior when they found that they had been, uh, they had lost half the time, but it didn't matter significantly whether or not they had oxytocin or placebo. So oxytocin doesn't do anything to your risk-taking behavior. It seems to do more with, as you can see here, something to do with the way you trust the other person. Now, they also did all this in the scanner. And so what we can see here is that they are some of the main feed areas that were affected by the feedback and whether or not they had oxytocin. And the three areas that they talked about the most here in this particular 
paper were the amygdala, the striatum, and just the midbrain. Um, these were all areas that they associated with more automatic and intuitive or even unconscious processes. So they think then that the main areas affected by the feedback of the oxytocin, the amygdala, the striatum, and the midbrain, um, these areas that are associated with automatic intuitive tells us then it's not really about controlled responses. That taken together, these findings suggest that oxytocin exerts its effect automatically or even unconsciously in subcortical brain areas, which, which can be modulated without explicit awareness of the subjects. Now, let's go through one more example of this, of this kind of trust game. And this is an interesting paper that was again published in Science and it's the case of borderline personality disorder. So King Casas et al. in 2008 published in, this in Science. They recruited 55 uh, uh, patients or I guess these were people actually, they weren't really patients, but they were people who had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder, you don't know much about it. It's um, characterized by feelings of emptiness and boredom, impulsive or unpredictable behavior, a poor sense of identity, instability of mood, a tendency to self-mutilate, unstable and intense relationships, poor control over anger and aggression, and an intolerance of being alone. So this is a profound personality disorder to have. And so they were able to find 55 people like this who had actually had borderline personality disorder. They also recruited a similar number of what they called healthy control participants, so people who didn't have borderline personality disorder. And their hypothesis was that if you put these participants in a trust game, that bipolar disorder participants would not be able to maintain a norm of cooperation because of this disorder that they had. So, like I said, this is like was done by King Casas et al. The uh, senior researcher on this study was Reed Montague, who's now at Virginia Tech University in the United States. And you can see here, this is sort of that same idea of a, an investor and a trustee, and you have multiple trials where you go on. I think this time they had 10 trials or 10 rounds of the game. And you can see they divided it from early to late. And down the lower left are the gray bars that you see there are two or pairs of dyads where the participant is a healthy investor, they don't have borderline personality disorder. The trustee is healthy, they don't have borderline personality disorder. And you can see that things go pretty well here between the first five trials and the next five trials, that you get a high rate of investment between you know something above 45% of the time, they're investing a lot of their money, and then that gets tripled, given to the healthy trustee to make a distinction about how much to repay. And there isn't really anything that's happening across those 10 trials. They kind of work out some sort of relationship as they work on this. On the right, however, you can see what happens when the trustee has borderline personality disorder. For the first five trials, there's not much of a difference between what goes on for those five trials as it did when you had a healthy investor and a healthy trustee. But when you get to the last five trials, look at how little the healthy investor is actually investing now. They're investing far less money than they did early on in the experiment because they have this trustee with borderline personality disorder. Something is happening. And of course, the main explanation there is that the person with borderline personality disorder is pocketing a lot of the money. They're keeping it. They're not giving the money back to the investor in a fair manner. They're violating this sort of norm of cooperation, this norm of trust. Um, and so, it's not working out. This is a bad relationship that we're having between this healthy investor and the person who has borderline personality disorder. When they looked at this in the scanner, what they found was that it was largely something that had to do with the insula again. So the anterior insula seemed to be the key of trying to understand what happened. On the left, you can see what happens when you have healthy trustees, when they're given different amounts of money from their investor. So if their investor um, gives them zero dollars, that is they don't trust them, and they just say, I'm gonna give zero dollars to the experimenter, and the experimenter triples zero dollars. And so then as a trustee, you find out that your um, the investor didn't trust you, you can see you get a lot of insula activity. But that insula activity gets smaller and smaller the more money that your partner decides to invest. And so when you get a partner who invests $20 in you and then therefore gets tripled to 60 and then you get to split it 30 and 30, you can see that that gives them, that causes them to have the least amount of insula. So there's this nice relationship, the more trust that the investor is putting into the trustee, the less the trustee's insula activity is. But look over on the right, the people with borderline personality disorder, it's all over the place. 
there is no relationship between the amount of money that's invested by the uh, investor um, and what amount of the insula activity we have here. So you can see that for zero dollars that they're not getting a whole lot of insula activity. This is a sign, by the way, that your investor doesn't trust you, but they don't seem to get upset about it. There's not much activity happening in the insula. They get a little bit more upset maybe on four dollars and eight dollars, a little less on twelve dollars, back up to sixteen, less than twenty. There's nothing there. There's no consistent relationship between the anterior insula and um, the amount of money that the trustee was willing to I'm sorry, the investor was willing to put into the trustee. So when offered a low investment, a sign of distrust from the investor, healthy trustees showed more insula activity, um, but the borderline personality disorder trustees showed no such activity, no such rela uh, relationship here. So this suggests that they have an inability to detect trust. They're having a really basic problem with other people knowing when other people are showing them signs of trust and distrust. And because they don't modify their behavior and response accordingly, that messes up their relationships with those people. All right, let's move on to our last topic, which is about honesty. And this is a nice little study that was done by Green and Paxton back in 2009. You see, we've been talking about cooperation and trust and, you know, and the fact that people could screw you over. And so then that just leads us to this question and kind of a nice way to connect to the next lecture, which is, you know, what makes an honest person an honest person? Is that an automatic or a controlled kind of response? Is it something that you are automatically honest or is it perhaps a controlled process that you have to think about? So there's sort of these two competing hypotheses about being honest that Green and Paxton entertained in their introduction. One is what they called the will hypothesis. And this means that in order for you to be honest, we need to control to fight temptation. That is, if you have a temptation to be dishonest and lie about what you did or to cheat, um, you're going to have to use your will to suppress that. You have to control it. So that's a controlled response. The grace hypothesis argues that there's no temptation at all to control. So you would never think about lying because it doesn't even occur to you. And because it doesn't occur to you, there's nothing to control. So that would be an automatic response to, to not lie. So the will hypothesis, according to Green and Paxton, would mean then that areas that are associated with response conflict, cognitive control, and response inhibition should be more activated when people are trying to control that um, lying behavior. And so the idea here is that areas like the ACC, the DLPFC, and the VLPFC should be more active if the will hypothesis is taking more of a, a role here. The GRACE hypothesis says that honesty is going to be associated with no increases in the ACC, the DLPFC, and the VLPFC because there's nothing to control. They don't have any suppression here of a temptation to lie, so they don't, and therefore um, you're not going to see those areas become more active. So how do you look at lying in the scanner? Well, what they did in this study was on each trial, um, you were told as a participant that in this next trial, for instance, you can win $3, okay? So that's why it says predict $3. So you get $3 if you get this right, all right? And what you have to do is guess whether or not the trial is going to end up being heads or tails, okay? So you're going to make a prediction about whether or not the computer picks heads or the computer picks tails, all right? Now, under it says no op that record heads, tails, they actually had to press a button to indicate whether or not they uh, predicted heads or tails. So they're recording their response in advance, okay? So they pick heads, they pick tails. So there's no opportunity to lie there. You actually are going to pick heads and tails and then find out whether or not the computer picks heads or tails. On the other trial, you can see that it says random heads, tails. This time though, they say you can press the button, but we know it's random and it doesn't mean anything. So just randomly pick your button, heads or tails. But in your head, go ahead and pick whether or not it's heads or tails. So that's an opportunity for you to lie. You can go ahead and um, say you picked heads, even though you picked tails, but you're gonna press a button randomly there. And so then what happens a couple seconds later is the computer tells you whether it was heads or tails. And then the computer asks, did you, get, did, the, did you get this correct or yes or no? Did you make the right prediction? And so if you predicted heads or said that you predicted heads, you could say yes. And if you got it wrong, you'd say no. If you said yes and you got it right, you won $3. So you get $3 on that trial 
if you were correct. So you can see it's all about honesty here in the sense that you on your head are actually saying here in the um, opportunity to cheat condition whether or not it's heads or tails. And so you could go ahead and decide whether or not you are lying here so you can get your $3 or not, right? In the no opportunity condition, everybody can't lie there because it's already going to be recorded beforehand. So what we are going to look at then is just an analysis of what happens on those trials where there was an opportunity to lie, to cheat. And what they found here is you can see that we have different kinds of participants. There are participants who um, they viewed as telling the truth, that these be people who around 50% of the time said that they had won. And the reason why they say those people are telling the truth is because 50% of the time the computer picked heads, 50% of the time it picked tails. So that would mean that by chance, if you're being honest, you should be hitting it around 50%. So anybody who was between 40 to 45, 45 to 50, 50 to 55, and 55 to 60, they were called the honest group. Then they have a little group of people here that are called the ambiguous group. And then finally, we have the dishonest group. And these are people who claim that they were correct above 70% of the time. You can even see there's people there who say that they were correct above 90% of the time. And so these people are clearly lying because it's just by chance they couldn't have been guessing at 90% of the time. And so that's why they're being called the dishonest group. And so what's happening is we're looking at the um, fMRI activity as they make these decisions. And basically what we see is that dishonest people showed more activity in those control areas and the honest people showed no such activity. So it did suggest then that the GRACE hypothesis was correct, that if you are actually an honest person, you don't need to control anything, but the will uh, hypothesis is correct for dishonest people because those dishonest people have to control their um, lying behavior and so they're going to recall they're going to use these sorts of activity these brain areas to control their response to make a dishonest choice so that tells us a little bit about some of the automatic versus controlled ideas that again if you're an honest person it probably is something you automatically do a person who is dishonest is probably going to use more controlled processes to control when they're going to be dishonest, when they're going to be honest. It's not coming natural to them, so they're using more controlled processes. All right, so that's all I have for this lecture. Um, as I said, we're going to be bridging into the next lecture on moral decision making. So this stuff about honesty that I've just brought up, we can talk more about some of the things like virtues at that next lecture. But this one, we've talked about the evolution of cooperation, development and cooperation, norms of cooperation and fairness trust and cooperation, and honesty. Thank you.